let's get those kind of monotonous things out of the way um, so that our sellers can deepen those relationships, spend more time um, building relationships, more time with their clients, uh, more time doing the things that really add value. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode. Today's guest is a sales enablement superstar with over 25 years of banking knowledge. She's a customer focused leader who works to ensure they get the right solution every time, skilled manager who works to enable her teams to succeed and help them hit their targets, senior vice president, director of sales enablement at BOK Financial, Linda Markham. Linda, so good to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, excited to talk uh, a few things. First off, the banking industry, when we got on a little prep call before this, it was really exciting, but also interesting to learn how different the sales process can be in a banking relationship. And it's one that I think a lot of, for our technology listeners out there that are moving into SaaS, can really listen up and learn from, right? Because you stay with these accounts for life, hopefully. You want a long-term trusted relationship. So tell me a little bit about what's going on in the banking industry and what sales enablement looks like for your industry. Sure. Well, you're absolutely right. It's a little different in banking. Those relationships are long. Um, and also our salespeople tend to stick around for a long time. So our average uh, tenure in that sales role is almost 11 years. So they're not, um, you know, we're not uh, bringing on new uh, sales folks every year. We're not bringing on, you know, huge numbers of new people that we have to mass train and mass push through a system of learning and kind of growing one product. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, you know, they have to have a really deep knowledge of what they're doing. And we have a lot of products to offer. You know, we don't, in banking, we don't have one or two products we sell. We can do a lot for a client. And so uh, in, in treasury, um, the area that I'm specifically in, you know, we have hundreds of products. So it takes a long time to become a professional and to be really good at it. So um, so sales enablement is maybe a little bit different, you know, in, a, in an industry where the sales team is that tenured mm -hmm. and um, where the life cycle is that long. It, it makes me think of some of the conversations we have around where buyers sit today. And, and you know, we did a survey over 600 B2B buyers, and it was really fascinating to see that what they valued more than anything was business acumen. And I'm thinking with the tenure that you have on your sales team, that's probably got to be one of their strengths. Would you say it's a strength in the, in the banking industry? And, and how does that come to relate to the customer relationship? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think we're, uh, they've been doing consultative selling way before it was ever called consultative selling, right? Uh -huh. So they're listening to the client, they're spending time with them, getting to know their processes. And then they're kind of like slowly over time, peeking holes and stuff and going, you know, I think we can help you with this. I think we can help you with this. And they're selling, they're not going to sell a hundred products at once, right? They're, they're going over and they're, they're saying like, what can I solve? What issue can I solve for you? And here's something I think it can help you do that. But it's, one uh, little piece of it at a time. So over time, you know, they may institute one set of services that needs to help them with specific need, but they continue to stay close to those relationships. And uh, the next time, maybe they're helping them with another aspect of their business. They know their get to know their clients really well, know their pain points. Um, and slowly over time, as, as technology evolves, we get new products too and uh, find new solutions for those problems. And so being a, a B2B seller in that role, I, I'd be curious, what are some of the skill sets or some of the traits that you look for? And not necessarily the hard skills, right? Because again, it's relationship selling. So yeah. what are some of those soft skills that really make a difference? I, the first one that came to mind is curiosity. I mean, I think, uh, you know, they have to want to know about their businesses. They have to be really interested about how their, their businesses, their clients' businesses work. And they want to um, really think through, um, you know, how they can relate in banking, how they can think, think through a way to help their clients um, 
uh, solve for the issues they're having. But they have to know the client really well. They have to understand their business. They have to understand how they're getting paid, how they're paying people, who they're paying, who their clients are. You have to dig really deep. Um, so I think curiosity is the first one that came to mind. They have to want to understand and they have to really want to ask those questions and really kind of internalize it and really um, think it through over time. And when you have somebody coming into your organization, maybe they're a little bit younger, what are some of the enablement programs you have that in place to maybe help support that learning and that growth? You know, I, we obviously have all that product training and that industry knowledge, but I think the great thing about having the 10 year sales team that we do is that they get a lot of time, you know, with folks that have been doing it for a really long time. So it really feels like a great, um, you know, when we've got somebody new coming in, it's fun to pair them up because if you think about, you know, a new, um, someone who's um, newer to that sales process, they're some, sometimes better at the some of those technology tools that we give people to find um, new clients and who to look for. But then, um, you know, sometimes those new New sellers have trouble finding how to, once they get in the door, how to have a good conversation, how to dig deep, how to not sell anything, but really get to know a client. And, you know, our experienced um, folks can really help them through that. It's it's a fascinating parallel because I was just on not too long ago with uh, JB uh, Sales, John Barrows, and John was talking about the SDR function and how a lot of other industries have really taken on that SDR function as like a prospecting and outbound. Uh -huh. And and it parallels to me the the younger people in your organization maybe having better opportunity to to get in the door, yeah. but I think where the gap is and where I see you filling it and this is why I love this parallel is those tenured sellers actually taking the deal from that point and being the most impactful ones to share that business acumen. Yeah, you know they kind of think of it as like you know they can uh, lock arms and do it together. You know, no one has to do it alone here. You know, we pair up in treasury with um, sometimes uh, relationship managers that tend to do more lending. Mm -hmm. um, they pair up together, and so sometimes um, even that um, uh, relationship is you know two different lines of business coming together, when one's a more experienced seller, and one's um, kind of younger and better getting in the door. So it's, it's a great way to uh, develop skill sets. So they don't take it over so that new person still gets to learn and become that seasoned seller. So it's, it's a good way of uh, um, connecting the two. Definitely. And, you know, I would go into the enablement a little bit. I'm curious the day to day of these banker, uh, the sales team in this industry. Yeah. I'm really kind of curious what that looks like, where they spend most of their time. You know, just for context, the Salesforce put out their state of sales and it was fascinating to see that, yep, only 27% of a seller's time is really spent selling, making that transaction happen and with the customer. What's that look like in banking? Well, interestingly enough, McKenzie, who does some um, some banking um, sales uh uh, reports kind of came up with a similar number in okay. banking. And it's not very different for us because those... Um, those bankers really own that relationship. So they're spending time with the clients. They're hearing from, you know, they're developing and deepening those relationships. Um, they're, um, you know, entertaining, getting to know them. Uh, they are then also problem solving, right? So if a client calls in and says, I'm frustrated with this, I got to get this done, they sometimes become the face of service. So I actually spend a fair amount of time, of my time, figuring out how to get our sales teams out of those processes. So I feel like a a lot of my role is uh, streamlining processes in the back end, uh, fixing things in the back end so that our sales team isn't doing that, right? So that they're not being the ones to have to call the client to fix the service issue. Uh, we have great service, a great service team that can do that for them, but the client gets to know them really well. So it's just natural that they're going to call the person they know. It's, it's so tough, right? There's that trusted relationship, but then uh -huh. you have that entire support team. How do you work to elevate or what do you coach on with your sellers to elevate their role a little bit so that they can get out of the weeds? Yeah, um, really, it's uh, trusting trust, right, that you have to have trust in the folks. So we're really lucky that we have our service team and our sales teams are uh, in the same city, right? They're, they're next nice. door to each other usually. So um, they, they know who that person is. They get to know them, that who that service person is. And so um, instead of saying, you know, someone's going to call you back, we're going to say Jane's going to call you back. And if Jane's not there, Bob's going to answer the phone and he's going to take care of you. So they, they have kind of a, a lot of trust in those. And we have a great service team that really does a good job of supporting them. So it's really about um, reminding them to trust their partners. And that's what they're best at and like letting the sales team do what they're best at. 
Nice. And and when product knowledge is so complex and so tough, there's so many solutions. How how is an enablement leader? How do you tackle that? It's, it's different every day, but I'm going to say we spend a lot of time rewriting and writing um, training and finding ways to get our sales team to do it. Um, uh-huh. What I found recently um, is that it really helps to use our sales teams, our experts, right? So our folks are experts at what they sell. And so we're asking them to tell their stories about how they got, you know, how they use this product to self, you know, to solve an issue for this client and sharing that. So the other teams go, oh, wait a minute, I have a client that kind of sounds like that. I think I can do that. So using the expertise of our sales team to help um, tell the story to the rest of the team. So really surfacing like the conversations, the details around the challenges, almost like mm-hmm. an internal case study. Yep. To kind of paint that picture. Yeah, it really helps. And, you know, we, um, you know, I'm sure other industries do that, but we have wedge products, right? So if you have a brand new client, sometimes it's easier to get in the door with this this one product. Um, and so we spend a fair amount of time making sure you know the wedge ones that you're getting in the door, and then you deepen the relationship with the stuff you have more time to research and dive into. So um, making sure they have access to uh, places where they can refresh their education on a specific product set, um, access to product owners who really know the products really well, Mm -hmm. Um, both for themselves and to bring out with clients. So giving them, kind of arming them with all the expertise we can. And what's the future look like for banking? You know, everybody talks about AI and, you know, taking the jobs. I'm I'm a firm believer in in Unifor. We've we've talked a lot about AI helping make humans better at what they do, taking some of that monotonous task out of the way. Uh Banking's a very regulated industry, so I'm sure maybe a little bit slower on the adoption curve, potentially, but maybe yes. not. Um, would cur- would be curious, what excites you about the future? Where do you see the, the role going in the future? Well, you know, I think, uh, you know, AI is going to be great. It's going to help us do lots of things in the future. Um, but people still, I mean, really, maybe sounds a little bit basic, but people want to have their money and their their banking services from people that they trust and they know how to get a hold of. Um, So I think it actually will help us a little bit because it's going to say like, let's get those kind of monotonous things out of the way um, so that our sellers can deepen those relationships, spend more time um, building relationships, more time with their clients, uh, more time doing the things that really add value. And if there was one challenge, you could clear the roadblock tomorrow, snap, we're going into a a nice long three-day weekend. What are some of those challenges that you see in your role in, in enablement and working with sales that you would just love to to clear out if you could? You know, uh, banking, we have some kind of we have some historical systems, right, that, that uh-huh. we've had over time that have built for a long time. We have big portfolios of clients. You know, we never have the right data. We, as well as our our sales team knows the mm-hmm. client, we don't have it all documented somewhere. So if uh, you know you want to take a week off, I don't have all that detail in your brain. So, you know, I mean, maybe it's just fresh in my mind because we're always, we're working on something right now, but I just feel like I wish I could get those names, phone numbers, addresses, who the right contacts are, their preferences out of, out of our sellers' heads and um, into a system that would uh, help us capture it and help them use it better. And I know there's systems out there. It's just still hard to get it out of their brain in there. It, it's the manual part, right? It, we we still don't have software that reads minds and uh, mm-hmm. and just translates it all into a CRM, and that that is a challenge for sure. I think you're not alone in in that challenge. I think that's almost across every industry and every every company to some extent. Yeah, that would be really great if you can solve for it. We let me know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go for for those listening. It is a it is an audience of sellers, so I must say <laughs> you might have solutions coming your way. Um, so. I'm curious. Take me back. How did you get into this role? What's your what's your background been like? Tell us a little bit about that. You know, so I've been in banking for a really long time, um, kind of worked my way up through different areas of the bank. And I worked for a small community bank um, mm-hmm. that was really focused in on client uh, on taking care of the client and spending a lot of time deepening client relationships. And um, I think it, it was really f- uh, foundational to who I am and how I work. Um it was a great organization that taught me a lot, and, I, and it was really small, and it grew really quickly. So I got to um, grow with them. Um, so I so I got to grow with that bank and take on more and more responsibility. So you know, I kind of leaned in towards um, 
you know, some product um, expertise and some operational things just because you get to wear lots of hats in a small organization. Yep. And um, that turned into uh, some great opportunities. And um, the ba- that smaller bank that I was with, um, I was the chief operating officer. So I got to do a lot of this front end sales stuff. And I got to do a lot of the, um, you know, the operational things to make it easier for our sales teams to work. So um, that bank was acquired by VOK Financial um, several years ago. And um, okay. after that acquisition, when VOK said, you know, hey, we've got an, we got an opening in product. And I was like, I don't know if I'm a product person, but you know what? It was great learning and um, it gave me great perspective to bring to the sales team. So um, a few a few years in, this role um, was a new role to our treasury organization and I was excited to um, take it on. It felt like um, a perfect fit of kind of being able to do a little bit with the sales team, a little bit of um, kind of operational fixing and uh, making things better. And uh, it really let me bring in that product knowledge too, which I think, you know, I tell people all the time, but sometimes you take sideways steps in your career that really deepen who you are and uh, what you bring to the table. That's tremendous. And and what a background. I think you almost have the trifecta there. When I think of uh, what goes wrong in, in the sales process or, or through a sales organization, it always comes down to the knowledge tools and systems in the back end, making it tough for a seller, right? Just making yeah. it so hard to get your job done and and then really knowing the industry. So must be great for them to have somebody like you in that enablement role. Well, I think it's a win-win for both of us. I'm really enjoying it and I hope I'm doing a good job. I feel like I'm doing a good job for them too. <laughs> That's awesome. What are some of the metrics that you pay attention to? Obviously revenue top line and some of those things, but what are some of the metrics that you kind of constantly are looking at or, or tracking to to know that your team's on course? You know, I think it, definitely we look at sales numbers yep. regularly. We're looking at closed deals, but we're also looking at kind of what's in their pipeline, how big their pipeline is. And I know that seems really basic, but, you know, um, even the stuff that's really far out. So we grade just like everybody else, you know, some stuff is kind of further out and some stuff is closer. And you want to see that there's a good mix of kind of stuff that's far out that's going to close in the in the long term and stuff that's going to close early, you know, pretty quick. Um, the other thing I think is a good, it's always good to keep a good eye on your mix of new clients and existing clients. So it's easy for some of these folks that have been around for a long time to have really big portfolios of clients and um, they can get kind of comfortable just taking care of their, their, their client base. And so it's, it's good to know that there's a good, to encourage and monitor that there's a good mix of uh, new clients as well. Do you find that all of your reps, are they full cycle? So are they doing most of the outbound, most of the, I mean, it is, it's the whole process. It is the whole process. And I would say that some of them, right, have huge portfolios. And so their new new business every year is much smaller and their new clients mm-hmm. are much smaller. And there's other folks that um, are primarily in growth uh, markets or, you know, or, or just growth in their career where they're going out and most of their deals are new clients that they're, they're looking and finding and building relationships with. So we have a mix. Mm-hmm. Nice. So take me back a little bit. What's, what's your upbringing? Tell me a little bit about the personal life. I'm curious. Sure. Um, uh, my parents were uh, immigrated from Portugal, actually, from the Azor wow. Islands off the coast of Portugal. So um, they came to the U.S. and uh, I think they taught me a really good, really uh, work hard ethic mm-hmm. about um, being curious and learning. Um, and they wanted um, they wanted us to be. They were. It was really important to them that we be um, hardworking and uh, um, you know part of that American dream, that standard American yeah. dream. So I grew up in. Uh, the Bay Area of California um, have a, a great kind of storybook family of, you know, two parents that stay together forever, two sisters that I'm really close with. Um, but in my young years, I, uh, I I wanted a strong family life. So after I got married, I uh, moved to the Midwest. So I live in Kansas City. Um, nice. I've been here 25 years or so. Um Really, it was all about family for me on the move, and I was lucky enough that you know I took a banking job to say I'm gonna I'm gonna do this because um, I had a banking job before. So I said I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue to work in banking while I figure out what I want to do for the rest of my life, and that's when I um, took a position with that smaller bank that I that was just fun to grow up with and learn from. So uh, yeah, and I'm married. I have three kids, and um, 
and two grand two grandchildren and one on the way. Congratulations. That's Thank very you. exciting. Nice. Thank you. And so outside of work, right? Put the yep. work aside. We've got the weekend coming up. What are some of the things that you love to do? And how does that maybe, I'm always curious, how does that parallel into or, or cross between that and, and the professional life a little bit? Sure. You know, I uh, I like to do things outside. So, you know, a big gardener um, and I can all my food that we grow. Um, okay. That's kind of new. That's a, That was a new kind of COVID um, hobby that came out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, spend time with family. So, you know, we've we like to do the pool and have um, the house that we get to host at. So we have a good set of friends that we like to uh, you know, do things with. And then um, our favorite vacation spot is a little beach place in Alabama. So we go to Dolphin Island, Alabama is our favorite little spot. So we go down there pretty regularly, four or five times a year. Um, it's a great family-friendly spot uh, where you can, uh, you can unplug a little bit. Um, you know, there's not a lot of technology there. There's not a lot of, um, it's, I always call it Mayberry at the beach. Very fun. Very nice. And I'm curious, your sellers, when they're doing a lot of their engagements, I'm going to flip back to this side. Um, is it often virtual or is it often in person? And, And I'm going this way because I'm curious, like on the relationship building side, how is the banking industry selling day by day? Is it is a lot of personal connection and a lot of personal relationship or is it more of like a, a virtual motion? I'm going to say it's a lot of personal relationships, but we let the client decide. So our sellers have the autonomy to say, like, you know, we're going to do this. You know, if the client wants to do it virtually. We're going to do it all virtually. If they want to do it in person, if they want to spend time getting to know each other over a golf course like you traditionally think of, then that's what they're uh-huh. going to do. So I think we let our sellers, dic- our, sorry, our clients um, dictate what's best um, for them. And um, it's it's a great mix because uh, it allows you to get some stuff done fa- much faster, right? Mm-hmm. To go close faster. And it lets the client drive the conversation. If the client needs more time in person to spend it across the table to feel confident about something, then we can bring a whole team in front of them if uh if they already know us well and they just want to add a few more, like we can do it really quickly over a virtual call. So um, I I think that's key to to any organization is to let your customers drive that decision. Don't make that decision for them. Very spot on. And and with dealing with bigger deals or like you said, that longer trusted relationship, I can imagine that it's not easy to win a new account from an incumbent. That's got to be quite a challenge. Yes. You know, there's some or there's some uh, some of those relationships that um, they're working on for years, yeah. right? We always have those great stories where you know they spent five years building a relationship, and then the right opportunity came, or it was the right time for the customer. So uh, you have to give um, your team the bandwidth and the time to say it's okay that it's going to build up. You know, you can't hire a brand new um, you know banker and just think that they're going to. Um, bring in a lot of business their first year. If they are, they're probably doing it wrong. Those aren't going to be long-term relationships. So you Mm got to give them time to build their book, um, build time to get their voice. And what's that ramp time look like? Like what's that process for your organization? And and when do you feel like they're finally up to speed? Yeah, it really depends on them because, you know, sometimes they come with a lot of experience and clients that come with them. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's that. And then there's others that just take a little longer. Um, Usually, you know, we don't tend to give our brand new um, TMA or Treasury Management officers their sales title. Um, Mm -hmm. We tend to not give them goals that first year. Oh, wow. Um, Or small or, you know, we they usually will bring in some some deal, but we just don't bring them give them goals that first year to give them time to ramp up and to uh, make sure that they're focusing on the right things, focusing on getting to know clients, getting to know um, individuals so they can bring in long-term good relationships. And that probably pairs up then as well, really well with the older, more tenured and kind of that, that pairing Mm -hmm. that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a really, um, a a luxury that we have, that we have that tenure, you know, and it's across our markets and it's in every market we serve. Um, we, we, you know, as an organization, we treat, our sales teams like you should. You treat them with the respect that they deserve and try really hard to um, keep their job about what they want it to be, which is building client relationships, um, 
hunting, right? Because there yep. isn't a salesperson out there that doesn't like, you know, winning and bringing in new deals, Absolutely. right? So you got to keep um, their jobs focused on those things and try to remove the rest of the noise. Um, and they stay, they, they stay because that's what, that's what they want, right? A really good salesperson wants to be able to have the tools they need and the, um, and, and take away all that other noise. So that's what they can focus on. That's awesome. And to think like your first year, right? Cause that is so many other companies will put you in and this is not a, a negative to it, but it's like, okay, you're in the seat. We've gone through two weeks of training. Now here's your quota number. <laughs> and that's like a fight or flight kind of position to be in. I feel like a lot of times that doesn't put the seller in the best mental mode to really build those long-term relationships. Yeah, it's just, I, th I think it just sets the wrong expectation. You know, I think anyone can go out and um, sell something, right? You can go out and sell a cup of water or, you know, to, to someone who does, who's not really thirsty, um, but they're not going to keep buying that water. They're not going to refill it. They're not going to um, ask you for the next thing, right? So I think we um, we want to encourage the right behaviors and uh, we want the right kind of people on our team that care about the clients that they're bringing in and care about the solutions they're offering. Yeah. And tell me a little bit about BOK Financial. Tell me, you know, kind of the the segments you serve and where you're located, kind of those areas and, and maybe some of the big industries that you support. Uh, well, we're a pretty big, uh, we're a nice size regional bank um, yep. and we primarily are in uh, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, Missouri, Kansas, Arkansas. I'm going to miss one and I'm going to be in trouble. Colorado, <laughs> Arizona, <laughs> Albuquerque. Yep. Um, so we have uh, banks across that whole section of um, the U.S. and um, both uh, and we have bankers on site and uh, treasury management teams on site in every one of those markets. Uh, we do have several verticals we um, support, you know, um, energy, commercial, corporate. Uh, we have a wide range of clients. Um, so uh, everything to uh, kind of larger companies to really small mom and pops. And uh, we focus in on building really good, deep relationships. That's awesome. Well, what do you think is at the core of, of your industry that maybe other industries could learn from in the sales space? I hear a lot of people sell, you say, you know, we sell solutions, we don't sell products. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I think that's accurate, but I think, you know, it's, it's maybe a little surface. I think we, we offer solutions to problems. Like just, you gotta, you gotta be really focused in on the fact that the client doesn't need a widget just to have a widget. You know, that mm -hmm. you have to dig really deep and understand um, what's causing friction for the client, how you can help them be better, how you can help educate them on, you know, um, sometimes financial products are a little intimidating, right? Because yep. we're talking about, you know, gosh, if you um, use a corporate card to slow pay this, you get your revenue this way. And we talk about numbers and it feels a little, you know, it can sound to someone who doesn't have a great financial ac acumen, Um it can be intimidating. So yeah. I, I like bring it down to their knowledge, depending on the client, right? Talk in their language, um, keep it simple, uh, speak to your client at the level they are. So if you're talking to a mom and pop, you can't talk about cash flow, right? And speeding up cash flow cycles and stuff, right? Yep. You can't, you, I mean, some maybe you can, I don't want to generalize too much, but you know, um, you have to talk at the speed your client is. And I think um, sometimes we try to fit clients in boxes. And I, I think every client's unique. And you got to train your um, your team to go up and go down, right, depending on the client. And so I'm cu curious, what are some of the tools or some of the things that you use? Because I'm thinking this is very much like traditional B2B sales, relationship-driven hasn't really done a huge digital transformation, but maybe prove me wrong. I, I'm curious, <laughs> what's, that, what's that sales tech stack look like and, and kind of some of the different solutions you have? Uh, well, I, okay, so there's a lot of questions there. Let me make sure I get them all. Yep. Um, we, uh, you know, we use all the traditional things that everybody else does, right? We use Salesforce, we use um, all the other, you know, um, how to find clients and all the other tools that everybody else yep. has. Um, so I don't think we're using anything super special on the tech side. I, I say we're probably a little low tech compared to some kind of sales enablement um, organizations. We probably focus more on 
our individual team and making sure that we're spending time with them, um, making sure they have time and access to people who are experts. So mm-hmm. um, we have product owners for all of our products um, that that we get in front of the sales team and, is, and they're, avail- they're available to take out if they need them to meet with clients and spend time with clients. And these are people that kind of run a whole product set for the bank. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, we're a, we're really good at um, keeping our team, you know, at lots of different levels close to the clients. So if if one of our sales team needs um, an expert, we're going to find them an expert in the organization to go out and make sure that they're talking at that level and they learn from it too, right? So then they're out in that conversation, they learn ten more things that they can take with them. That's tremendous. I, the support for that side of things. I think of like the sales engineer in other industries, but Mm -hmm. this is truly a subject matter expert on the business acumen side and knowing the product. But like you said, knowing, okay, what is this product actually going to do in that financial situation? And I would say our product owners, you know, I haven't looked up their tenure in a while, but I'm guessing, yes, that team is even more tenured than our sales team. Wow. Yeah, it, te- it it truly is a testament. Like the one thing I take away from this is it's a testament that business acumen and those longer term relationships can just build sustainable stronghold businesses. It's such a different than the what I think we've seen in a lot of industries in the past few years, which is growth at all costs. This is very like strategic, targeted, specific accounts, specific people, and and so your enablement then must be very focused on the target accounts that they're going after. Sure. We definitely spend time saying these are the kind of clients that look good, right? These are the clients that are going to help bring in deposits. These are the kind of the kind of clients that we look for. We um, show them that, um, show that with what success looks like um, Mm -hmm. and ask them to go looking for those. We absolutely do that. That's awesome. Well, this has been fun to learn what enablement's a little bit like in the, the banking industry. I have to ask, if you took yeah. yourself back into that COO role, if there's one word of advice, uh, or even maybe before that, when you first started into banking, what would you give yourself? Any advice? Uh, your career is never going to look like a ladder. I don't know who ever used that accurate, right? That picture to describe what your career is going to look like. You're just going to keep taking steps up that ladder. I very much thought that was what it was, my life was going to look like. And I just, I think you move um, in, in different ways and um, through an organization and through your learning um, to get where you need to. Um, so, so think of your career as um, almost like education, right? You're spreading yourself out to learn new, um, new tools, um, new verbiage, new skill sets to practice things. Um, it's just not going to always be this vertical step up, notch, climb, step, step, step. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, I mean, sometimes it does maybe for others, but I think, you know, for me, I would say, you know, there's patience in that um, sitting in a different seat while it's uncomfortable is great learning. That's a great word of advice. And I think for right now, a lot of people looking at jobs changing, industries yeah. changing. I mean, the pace of change, I think it was set in 2008 or 2009, but it is truly faster than it's ever been. Yeah. And so keeping up is tough. Keeping up is tough. But you know what? All those things you learn along the way, it is tough to keep up on some of those technology pieces. But the skill sets, um, the things you do, they all come with you, right? I mean, uh, those experiences make you who you are. So you may not remember. um, You you may not have every skill set you need, but you do have knowledge and you bring worth with every role you go to. Great advice, especially for those climbing the career ladder or in this case, figuring out what that ladder is going to look like, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, I I have to say thank you so much, Linda, for joining us. This has been a ton of fun to learn from you. Where can people connect? Where can they learn more about BOK? Um, Just share some of those links and we'll put them in the show notes as well for everybody to connect with you there. Absolutely. So um, uh, you can find me definitely on LinkedIn. Um, BOK Financial has a great kind of educational piece called The Statement that we send out to people that gives them industry knowledge, um, specific things. So you can find that on anyone on our page, on our website, obviously. You can link to it or I'll send you a link for it. Um, But BOK Financial, obviously, online and then um, mostly on LinkedIn. 
Perfect. And if you are a business owner, I got to give a shout out and you're in that area or if you're, you know, if you're a listener and a customer of be okay, that would be even greater. Give us a comment, share your, share your thoughts and uh, make sure to connect uh, with Linda here. Linda, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. And to all of our listeners, you can catch this and all of our episodes anywhere you listen to your podcasts or catch us on YouTube as well. Check it out on video and uh, you can see these bright shining spaces and, uh, and actually get in the action that way as well. So till next time, thank you so much for listening. And here's another episode. Talk soon. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.